Hello everyone. Welcome back to our video Bible study series. This is Functioning as the Lord's Church. I hope that you and your family continue to be healthy and well, uh, that you're ready to get back into this Bible study that we're doing together. Let's get started. Remember that when we're talking about this question, how do we function as the Lord's Church, the church is not the building. Uh, it's not a physical structure. It's not bricks and wood and all that. The church is the people, the body of believers, the family of God. And so we're, we're answering the question, what exactly do Christians do? And we'll look to the teaching of the New Testament to find that out. We've covered together the first major subtopic here, and that was the issue of worship. Christians worship God. And we talked about what is worship and what isn't. Uh, talked a little bit about actions of worship and worshiping in spirit and in truth. Now, we need to get to some other ideas. And tonight we start into our next major subtopic. Uh, what do Christians do? Uh, what are we meant to busy ourselves with? And so we're going to begin now talking about the area of evangelism. It is important that men and women of God would be involved in evangelism. Now, I know that's maybe not a word that people use every day, and those who are familiar with it, they may just think evangelism is really scary. I don't like that topic. I don't like when preachers talk about it. I don't like when we have a class about it. I definitely don't like when we have a, a seminar or a meeting about it, and people encourage me to attend. Maybe evangelism makes you uncomfortable. Maybe that's one of the reasons that we need to understand it better so that we can be more comfortable with it. And evangelism, it's, it's not meant to be a, a scary or a, an impossible thing where you just throw up your hands and say, oh, I can't do that. Someone else could, but not me. Allow me for a minute to try and reframe this topic and this subject a little bit in your mind and for our purposes in this study. Don't think so much about the word evangelism. Think about it this way. Sharing the message of the gospel. Now, that sounds different, or at least it ought to. Maybe you think, hey, this is still scary. But we want to be very biblical in our study of this topic, look to what the Scripture has to say, and also through the next several Wednesdays, we're going to try and offer some practical pointers as well, so maybe it can be more approachable to you. Now, saying it this way, sharing the message of the gospel, uh, should give you a little bit better grasp of what we're talking about here. What is it to evangelize? Well, we're talking about the gospel, the good news. We're talking about Jesus and what he's done for us, and specifically what Jesus taught. Do you remember we need to be obedient to the gospel? And so the teaching of his grace is all contained herein. You can think about texts like Acts chapter 8, Philip and the eunuch, and he preaches unto him Jesus. Uh, he's sharing the gospel message with him. And you remember the result of hearing Jesus preach to him. The eunuch said, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? So clearly the teaching of Jesus or the sharing of the gospel message includes our obligations, how we are obedient to the gospel, how we submit to Christ's rule in falling in line with his teachings. Uh, so that's what we want to try and do here. I think about the way I heard one preacher describe talking about a topic like evangelism, because many in the church do find it to be a scary topic. He said there's two ways to do it. He said, I could be real nice to you and talk about the different helps that are available and hold your hand and, and really gingerly bring you through to the idea of, of realizing you can share the gospel. Or I could be very direct about it. And I can tell you Christ didn't call you to a comfortable life. We are commanded to evangelize. This is something we must do. So whether or not you're comfortable, whether or not you like it, whether or not you feel nice and safe, you must do it. Uh, now I think a, a good approach is probably somewhere between those two. Uh, to tell you that it is a command, but also to encourage you to say that this is something that we're well equipped for. It's not about how great we are as communicators or how skilled we are as, as salesmen. You know, we're going to shine up this lemon of a used car and pass it off to some guy. No, not at all. It's the beauty of the Word of God. It doesn't take great salesmanship. Yeah, we need to know a little bit about how to approach people and, and not be offensive, uh, but clearly, God's Word is going to shine through. That's the attractive component here, not us. We want people to be drawn to Christ. And so what you'll find through the next several lessons, a lot of the strength of evangelism is for the evangelist to get out of the way and just allow God's Word to do its work. 
Uh, but we need to be there to promote God's word and to really have people come into contact with the word of truth. Uh, and also, we'll say at this point, there is a need to make connections between the Christian evangelizing and everything else the Christian does. Uh, let me tell you a little bit what I mean by that. The church exists for the purpose of sharing the gospel. That is a primary component. That is a key part of functioning as the Lord's church. Christians must evangelize. But realize any efforts given toward sharing God's word, any efforts given towards that end will falter, will fail, if the Christian is not also exalting God, is not also helping others, is not also growing spiritually, and isn't also you know, living out that truth. If we are living lives that are marked by hypocrisy, it doesn't matter how hard we try and evangelize, anyone we're speaking to is going to see that, recognize it, and be turned off immediately. And so just as important as it is to say Christians must share the message of the gospel, we need to always include with that, and Christians must live by the gospel, live in obedience to Christ's teaching. Uh, like we said, otherwise our words, they fall flat. So we need a firm foundation living by faith, and then our evangelism moves forward unhindered. Uh, people, people recognize sincerity, and they recognize the opposite even quicker. Now, you may be surprised to, to learn the word evangelism doesn't appear in the Bible, at least not in that form, not in a way that you could easily recognize it. The word in, in our English language evangelism actually comes from the Greek word for gospel. And perhaps this is another reason it's also helpful to reframe it this way, sharing the message of the gospel, because evangelism, in its, in its root, the origin of that word, we are talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let's talk about the word for gospel. Of course, the literal meaning of gospel you're probably familiar with, it is good news. Uh, and so this good message that we're trying to announce the good news uh, about Jesus. And just on that word announce, if, if you'll allow me for a minute, in our previous lesson, when we we're talking about preaching as part of worship, you know, one of the things that we see in the terms for preaching in the New Testament, it is very much to announce, to proclaim. You remember to do the job of the herald, like the town crier, hear ye, hear ye. And so when we talk about being an evangelist or working in evangelism, sharing the gospel, it's really what we're doing. We are announcing the good news. We are proclaiming, we are heralding out glad tidings. Now, good news about what? Glad tidings of what specifically? There's a lot that you could bring in. Uh, first and foremost, it, it is a Jesus-centered message. I heard one guy just summarize the idea of gospel that way. He said, what is gospel? It is the Jesus story. Uh, and everything included with that, including our obligations. But if you break down a little list, it would be glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the Messiah, glad tidings of salvation through Jesus Christ, and salvation is always a, a primary point here, glad tidings of the grace of God manifested in Christ, and that that grace is opportunity for the hearer. God's grace is opportunity for mankind to obey the teaching of grace, to now be in a right relationship with him based on how you respond to this message. Anytime you think about the gospel, uh, and as it relates to our duties toward evangelism, we are giving people an opportunity to react to God's word. We're going to hit this point a lot more in some of these later lessons, but let me go ahead and introduce it now. You cannot measure success in evangelistic efforts by number of baptisms. I believe that's the wrong metric. That's the wrong idea. You need to measure success in evangelism based on how active Christians are being in spreading that good news, in proclaiming, in announcing the gospel. See, if you have a Christian who announces the good news to his neighbor, to his friend, to his family, that is a success. That is true evangelism. Now, that hearer has an opportunity to either reject the message or accept it. 
But them rejecting the truth of God, that doesn't mean you failed in your efforts of evangelism. You did your job. You did what was right. Now, they had a bad reaction to it, but we can't control the actions of others. We just have to make sure that we're doing our duty. Uh, now, of course, there's always room for improvement in how we speak or how much we know or how we might approach difficulties in the realm of evangelism. But to, to say that we are carrying this message and that that's a failure, that's wrong. To carry the gospel message is a success. And to do it great, you must first do it poorly. You must first grow, you know, start at those very beginning steps and you'll become better and better at it. Uh, so you can see a little what I mean about that balanced approach. It's a command, but we can be encouraging. We can say, hey, let's get this together. When you talk about some verses on this issue, on the topic of evangelism, let's first show that it is a command and that it is God's will that his followers would share the message of the gospel. We'll start at maybe a very, uh, maybe the most well-known, Mark 16, 15 and 16. Uh, we often refer to this as the Great Commission. Of course, it's Jesus speaking. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Okay, so know this, mark this. God wants us to be sharing the gospel. It is very clear that that is his desire. That is the marching orders that we've received as members of the church, as followers of God. Go into all the world. Uh, the idea of going forward and the wide scope is very much present here in all the world. And notice, preach the gospel to every creature, uh, literally all creation. And so matter no matter what nation someone comes from, no matter what their ethnic background, no matter what their religious background, we are told to carry the gospel to them. And this is a very important point. You and I do not have the authority to prejudge. And you and I should never put ourselves in that position where we're looking at someone, thinking about announcing the good news to them, and we say, no, not that person. Someone else maybe, but not that person. You know, to turn someone away and not give them the opportunity to either accept or reject, not give them the opportunity to hear God's word, that is clearly against the teaching of the Bible. It's against what Christians are supposed to do. It's, it's against our function, against our design. And so we go into all the world and preach, Harold announce, the gospel, that good news about Jesus, to every creature. Now, why does God want all his followers to be sharing the gospel? Why is this a command in the New Testament? because of the importance of salvation, because of God's love for souls. And that's seen in verse 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Why should you and I share the message of the gospel? Because we want others to be saved. Why should you and I give people the opportunity to hear the message of Jesus? Why should you and I be zealous toward evangelism and growing in our efforts as evangelists? so that more people would believe and be baptized, so that more could be added by the Lord to his church. And then the other side of that same lesson, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Why does God want all his followers to share the gospel? Why do you and I need to evangelize and grow in these efforts of evangelism? Because we don't want others to be lost, because we care for their soul, because we don't want them to be in eternal damnation, separate from God in eternal hell, because they have not obeyed the gospel call, because we desire something far better for them, because we want them to be a part of the church family rather than eternally separate from God, we need to make sure that we are carrying this message to them. And it's very clear as you study the Bible, God has decided that he would use followers, men and women, to share the good news of salvation. That is, he would have his initial followers go and create more followers. Sometimes when we talk about this idea or this principle, we use the term human agency. And that is that mankind would be God's agents to spread this good news, that he would, uh, you know, further this message through them. He would use men and women 
so that other men and women could come to a knowledge of the truth. Let's explore this idea through a couple of uh, different scripture references together. First, you could look to Acts 8. Uh, here is 26 and 29, and we referenced this just a minute ago. This is Philip coming to the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, this is where you remember the eunuch is reading from Isaiah. Uh, there's a messianic prophecy, and he doesn't understand who's, who's Isaiah writing about. It? Is it himself? Is it some other man? And Philip, beginning at the same scripture, preached unto him Jesus. We know the end result. He responded very well to this message. He was baptized. He was uh, you know, going on his way rejoicing because he was added by the Lord to his church. We see salvation as a result here. But how did it all start? How did this Ethiopian eunuch hear the message he needed to hear? How did he come in contact with the gospel? Uh, well, Philip was sent by God, human agency. So Acts 8, 26, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Okay, so the, the context, it, it follows through. He's obeying this command. He's going where... The Spirit sends him. Look at verse 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. Uh, the chariot, that's where the Ethiopian eunuch is. He's traveling along. Uh, he's, he's returning. And so Philip joins him there, and that's where their conversation begins. That's where he begins uh, this work of evangelism. Now, the point I want to make is this. We have the angel of the Lord, in verse 26, speaking to Philip directly. And someone might stop and ask, well, if God is speaking in this, in this way toward Philip, why doesn't he use the same method with the eunuch? Why don't we read that the angel of the Lord spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch and said, hey, Isaiah is talking about Jesus of Nazareth. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the one you must obey and be baptized into to avail yourself of that saving blood of his death. Well, it's not God's will that the angel of the Lord would approach each one, and that's how men and women would become Christians. It's God's will that his followers would evangelize. And so rather than the angel of the Lord speaking to the eunuch, telling him what he must do to be saved, the angel of the Lord speaks to Philip, and he says, you go tell him. The angel of the Lord prepares Philip. And then you look to 29, the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Notice the Spirit doesn't speak to the eunuch and say, here's Jesus, here's salvation, here's baptism. No, the Spirit speaks to the one who is right with God, to the one who is in the church, to the one who is a Christian, and says, go near and overtake this chariot. Go and preach to him. Go and take this opportunity to evangelize, to teach. And so we have God clearly showing the ability to speak directly and also at the same time showing his will, his desire. Not that God would speak to each one or that God's angels would speak to each one and evangelize to them. No followers of God, members of the church, you and I do the work. We are God's agents to declare this truth, the message of the gospel. There's another account very similar to this. If you go to Acts 9, this is where we see the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And we're not going to take the time to read through the whole chapter. I think you're probably familiar with this, uh, this account. But look at Acts 9 and verse 6. So he, that is Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. All right, now you remember, he sees the great light, the blinding light there on the road to Damascus. He has this conversation with Jesus. And Jesus makes it very clear that Saul is persecuting him because he's persecuting his church, persecuting Christians. And so rather than continuing to fight against the Lord, seeing that he was wrong, Saul of Tarsus says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now notice, if it was God's desire that God would evangelize. If it was God's desire that uh, either the Father or Jesus or angels or the Spirit would speak how man should be saved to each individual man, this is the perfect opportunity, if that was God's will, if that was his desire. This is the, the exact chance that he needed. Lord, what do you want me to do? Well, let me tell you, Saul, you need to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. No. God's will is human agency. So you notice, then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told 
what you must do. And if you allow me to kind of paraphrase or add on here, it's very clear if you read chapter 9, what the Lord is actually saying to Saul is, I have prepared someone. I have a follower of mine who will declare the message of the gospel to you, who will tell you what you need to be obedient to, who will deliver to you the words whereby you will be saved. And actually, if you study Acts 9 for yourself, you'll see there's even more to this story. The man who was prepared to tell Saul what he needed to do to be saved was a man named Ananias. And the Bible records how God is not only speaking to Saul, telling him to go to the city, but God is also at the same time speaking to Ananias, telling him you're going to go and help Saul. And so we've got God working on both sides of this, but neither one is God saying, let me evangelize. No, God says, I've prepared a preacher for you. And God tells Ananias, you go and you preach to him. You go and you declare these words. You tell him what he needs to do to be obedient, to, be, to become a child of mine. Uh, and this, this beautiful model, it is repeated over and over. You see it a lot, of course, here. This is the book of Acts, the book of conversions. But you can, you can know from your study of the New Testament, this is God's plan. This is God's will. Uh, let's go one further. In Acts 10, this is where we see uh, Gentile inclusion. It's the events surrounding Cornelius that Gentiles have the same access to repentance unto life, and they don't have to be channeled through Judaism. No, in Christ all are one, so Gentiles can obey the gospel. Gentiles can be added by the Lord to his church without any connection to uh, the law of Moses, without any connection to Judaism. So you look at Acts 10, Look at 5 and 6. It says, Now send men to Joppa, and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. This is another occasion where we see God talking to both sides. Just like in Acts 9 with Saul and with Ananias, here he's got Peter and he's got Cornelius. And so Peter is being prepared. You remember uh, what he saw, the great sheet let down with all sorts of animals and the unclean there, arise, kill, and eat. And he says, no, these are unclean. I, I can't do this. God is using that to teach him about Gentiles having access. Uh, that I have created these, don't call them common or unclean, and that it's my will that you would go and preach to them. He further shows this when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, uh, showing that divine touch. Uh, of course, that's deeper into this chapter. But Cornelius and those who are with him, they, they respond to the truth. Uh, meanwhile, they're being told, like you see here, you need to send for Simon Peter. He's going to come. Notice the last part of verse 6. This is where it's really at. He will tell you what you must do. Well, again, we've got God speaking in a very direct way to this individual, this God-fearing man, Cornelius. But he doesn't tell him what he needs to do to be saved. He says, you sin for Peter, he will tell you what you must do. Very clearly, God's will is for human agency. Now, pause for a minute. Can you imagine if we remove Peter from Acts 10. Can you imagine if we remove Ananias from Acts 9? Or can you imagine if we remove Philip from Acts 8? Well, what you would have is a eunuch riding in his chariot who does not have someone to help him understand the scripture. What you would have is a blind man, Saul of Tarsus, going into the city having no one uh, to help him know what he must do, how he must be obedient to Christ who he has been fighting against. And what you would have is Cornelius and his household in Acts 10 who are still wondering, how can we have access to salvation? How can we have access to Christ? What must we do to be pleasing to God? Now, of course, you see the point. God prepared Philip, Ananias, and Peter to be there, to evangelize, to preach, to declare to them not just the story of Jesus, but also the obligations of that story. What they must do to be obedient to the gospel, to obey the teaching of God's grace. God's will is human agency. God wants us, all of us, to be sharing the gospel with others. That's why it's so important that we would talk about evangelism. Even if it's a scary topic for many, even if it's something that makes us feel uncomfortable, even if it's something we want to throw our hands up and say, oh, I, I can't do that, someone else could, but not me. 
as we continue through the next several lessons here, we're going to talk about how we can all be involved in this work. And one of the beauties is we don't all have to do it the same way, and that's good. It's helpful that we don't all evangelize in the same way, but we all must share the message of the gospel. It's part of how we are designed to function as the Lord's church. Uh, I want to go ahead and cut it off there. We're going to pick up on some ideas when we come back next week. I think the first thing we'll talk about is that Great Commission where we started in Mark 16. And just to show, to really prove from the scriptures, that that has application toward Christians living today. Because I believe there are some who will look at Mark 16 and even some of these chapters from the book of Acts and they'll say, yeah, that's what the apostles and some other early Christians had to do, but Christians today surely don't have to do that. That was then, that doesn't apply to me. So we want to deal with that first, just to show that this does apply to us and it is uh, really marching orders for all Christians. Uh, so we'll continue through this. Uh, I see the evangelism subtopic taking uh, perhaps five or, or six classes. We'll kind of see how it goes through this study, and I'll try and be better about watching the time. I think we did pretty good today, not going too long. Uh, again, thank you for clicking on this. Thank you for going through this study with me. I hope that you continue to be well uh, until we get back together next time. Thank you, and God bless.